Good evening, Rocky Peak. Hey, it's so great to be with you. My name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors, and hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and uh, it's good to be uh, back together. Uh, I'm going to go into a time of teaching in just a minute, but just a couple of quick things uh, I wanted to uh, add. Where we're, we're going to do is we're doing so many announcements. I'm just going to do the announcements, and then we're going to close in prayer. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I wanted to mention next weekend, we have something very special planned, is that uh, you saw what our initiative for the poor is this year, but if you were here two years ago, you remember we did one of our largest ever initiatives for the poor, where we collected funds so we could send uh, pastors from war-torn Sudan, or uh, uh, people who'd love to go in the pastorate, uh, to Uganda, to the African Renewal uh, University, to get an education uh, so they could be better equipped to advance the gospel. And if you were here, then you remember we raised, I think it was $221,000 for that. And those students are now going through the program, the, the first ones. And so next weekend, uh, we're going to be showing you a video, kind of an interview when I was over this last year uh, with some of those students. But next week, uh, the, um, the vice chancellor, really the head of African Renewal Ministry, his name is uh, David Fogoyo, is going to be here with us. And so we are going to show the video. We're going to introduce D uh, David, and then I've asked him to speak to us and bring us the word next week. And so this is, you know that we don't do this very often. We don't have many outside speakers at Rocky Peak, but we have something very special. Uh, and so it's going to be an incredible weekend, and I want to make sure that you get that on your calendar. If you have to be gone, of course, you can YouTube it. The other thing is, and tomorrow I might not share this because this service might go so long tonight, it might be like 9.30. <laughs> but um, I'm going to try it out on you and see how it goes. You'll just get a little bit extra. It was just really cool. We just had a, a team come back, or several people from our church were part of a, a ministry team that went to Nairobi uh, with the Into Focus uh, ministry. And, uh, and so it was really cool that um, there's this one lady I was corresponding with. She came to Rocky Peak about three years ago, and God had just met her in a powerful way. And so we corresponded beforehand and during the time and so on. And she just sent me this incredible email this week. And I thought, I'm going to share it with you, right? Just because it's just awesome what God's doing. She said, uh, hi, Pastor Michael. I've been meaning to write you. I've had jet lag and I caught an awful cold. But it was an amazing trip and what God did. We went to three prisons. We saw over 100 inmates. Um, and then we went to a village primarily 90% Muslims. The chief of the village was a Muslim. We prayed, and he prayed in Jesus' name, and we were all shocked. Over 70 people got saved. I sang a song, Jesus Loves Me, Yes, I Know, to the children, and they learned it, and they sang it with me, and I thought, oh, my God. I might get shot now. So the chief heard the children sing it with me, and I stopped when I saw the chief, and he smiled at me and said, I really like this song. Can you sing it again? And I was so shocked. I did, and he smiled when all the children sang it together. Uh, I, I, uh, did eye, uh, I did the eye reading glasses. I handed up Bibles to people that got saved. I saw God do miracles. I've never seen God move in such a miraculous way. We were the only the fair-skinned American people there. She's actually from the Middle East, so we stood out. I have tons of pictures to show you. We stayed at places where there were no showers. We had buckets and toilets that didn't flush. We went to church and danced, and some of the teams said they had never danced in church like this. So much joy. So we all got to go to church and share why we wanted to come to Nigeria and do this. I, I was so scared to share in front of people, but Jesus was with me. All your messages and teachings have brought me to this. Listen and follow. I obeyed, past, I obeyed, Pastor Michael. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for, he, for healing, helping me to be healed and get beyond my fears and to follow Jesus. I never knew what my purpose was, but God is giving me a vision to see. You said put your gospel glasses on. Now I can see my purpose. I trust in the Lord. I don't lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge him. He'll direct my path. Proverbs 3, 5. I take the scripture wherever uh, I go. Thank you for coming and surprising us before we, went to, before we left to pray. I uh, had so much peace knowing my pastor was there. God bless and so on. But isn't that an awesome story of, of really of listen and follow, right? And uh, it's just beautiful to see that as we as a church are learning to listen and follow, it's incredible what God is doing. 
And I'm excited as we go into this Christmas season to see the next chapters of his story for us. And as we go into next year, what he has planned for us. Amen? So uh, now that we're about three hours into the service, I'm ready to teach. So uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, we're just uh, excited to be here, to be pursuing you as a church. And we're excited what you're doing. God, as we see these we see this initiative for the poor coming up. We hear about the Sudanese students, what's going on. We hear about Nigeria. We just thank you for what you're doing in and through our people. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us today and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would come and speak powerfully to us as we enter this Christmas season and we learn how to listen and follow as we live out the gospel in our life. We pray this in your name. And everyone said... Amen. Well, our story today starts early in the morning. In fact, it's, uh, it's 5.30. It's a chilly winter morning. And the alarm, wake, alarm goes off. He gets up. His wife is in bed next to him. He gets up and quietly goes to the bathroom that's attached to their master bedroom. He showers and shaves, gets dressed. And then like he does every day, he walks out through the house leaves the house, crosses the breezeway, goes into the cold garage where for the next hour he will spend time with God. He does this every day. During the winter months, he has a small little space heater he puts by his feet so he doesn't freeze. For the next hour, he's going to pursue God. For the next hour, he's going to listen to what the Spirit will say. For the next hour, he's going to read the Word and memorize Scripture. He's going to talk through his life and he's going to pray because he's a quiet man, he never says much about this, but his family all knows that he does this. And But the only evidence is from time to time, verses will pop up around the house, carefully scripted on a four-by-six card in his beautiful script. That There might be a verse above the mantle, it might be a verse on the bulletin board that is at the head of the hallway that goes down to the, the bedrooms. It might be over the, over the phone in the kitchen, But little does he know the impact that these times are having not only on his life, on the life of his family, but in life of thousands of lives that he will never meet. Well, today, we are continuing our series that we've been in now forever, um, (laughs) since the fall, start of the fall. It's called The Gospel, and uh, for those of you who are new, I want to welcome you. Um, this is a series that's based on a letter from one of the leaders of the early movement of Jesus. We call him the Apostle Paul. He's writing this letter to uh, a group of uh, Christ followers that live in about 850 miles away in a Roman colony in modern-day Greece, right on the border, near the border of Europe and Asia today. And the name of the city is called Philippi. And so what we're learning in this this series, the the reason we call it the gospel is because in this letter, more than any of his other 13 letters in our New Testament, he uses the word gospel more per page, more per paragraph, more per word than any other letter. But as we've seen, uh, his focus is not just on the epic message of the gospel, that as we've said so many times, is so much bigger and brighter and bolder and higher and wider and deeper and richer than we've often understood. But his focus on what does it look like to follow Jesus and live out the gospel in our everyday lives. Now, today we're breaking in or continuing in chapter 4, the final chapter of this letter. And we're going to pick it up at chapter 4 and verse 4. There in your note sheet... You have a section called The Gospel, uh, Steps to Success. Now, last week, if you were here, Drake took us up through chapter 4, verse 1. And if you were here a couple months ago when we were teaching on chapter 2 of Philippians and about this conflict in the church, I looked carefully at chapter chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 about these two women that were leaders in the church, but uh, conflict going on between them. So we've covered that. So we're going to pick it up at today, chapter 4. And what's happening today is this is, we're entering into the final home stretch of this letter. These, this is what we're going to read today are Paul's final instructions. Now at the end, he'll do sort of epilogue about this, this gift that's been given them and 
kind of what they learned from it that he's, they, they sent to him in prison. And so there, there's more to come, but these are like the final instructions of how to live the gospel, how to follow Jesus. And so we're going to pick it up at chapter 4 and verse uh, 4, and then we'll go through verse 9 today. And so he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, by petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And if you do that, the peace of God, which transcends all you know, human understanding, will guard your heart. It's a military word. Uh, uh, Philippi was a Roman colony which meant it had a Roman garrison there, not only to protect the city, but also to guard the interests of Rome in the area. And so he uses a military word. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, by the way, lovely, it always just kind of, I, I, I get stuck in my throat. I always think of like sweetly, you know, like sweet, like, kind of those little like angel things with verses on them. Um, that's not what he's talking about. It's sort of like agreeable, pleasant, um, positive. So whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think or reflect on such things. And then whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or you've seen in me in my life, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And so in this short section, he says, hey, you want, to listen to, you want to learn how to listen to follow Jesus? You want to live out the gospel? There's some final instructions. And what I want you to catch is that so many of these instructions are really not random. They're really a reminder of some of the teaching he's given them in the context of the whole letter, as we'll see. And so what I want to do today, as we continue to talk about how do you live a life that's worthy of the gospel, how do you live the gospel, is I want to talk about five steps that Paul highlights here that we need to take constantly in our life if we're going to live a life worthy of the gospel. So there in your note sheet, you have a section called the gospel, five key steps. So let's jump in. The first step is, is that Paul says we need to keep your perspective. Keep your perspective. And so in this, uh, in this letter, Paul has reminded us of the epic truths of the gospel, who God is, who we are, what it looks like to follow Jesus. And if we're going to live a life worthy of the gospel, we have to live a life in, the, in, in light of those epic realities. Right? We, we have to keep that perspective so we can live a life in light of these epic rallies. Now, this flows out of chapter 4 and verse 4, this first command that Paul gives of rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. And again, I say rejoice, just in case we're slow on the uptake and we missed it. Right? Now, at first glance, this sounds like a Christian version of positive thinking, doesn't it? And, hey, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, don't worry, be happy, right? Uh, and so uh, I want to point out there's something, there's much more going on here than what meets the eye, which is why we need to read the scripture in context, right? And so I, I want to point something out. First of all, I want to point out that this is not the first time that Paul has said something like this. In fact, I want you to turn back to chapter 3 and verse 1. So if you were here three weeks ago, We talked, we, we broke into this new section of Scripture in chapter 3 and verse 1. So this was the week of baptisms. If you were here, you remember that. I know it seems like eight years ago. But in chapter 3, at least it does to me, but in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, further, my brothers and sisters, he's kind of starting a new topic, rejoice in the Lord. Now, you remember that? And he says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. Now, if you were here then, we talked about this. We said that what Paul is saying is he's not saying, uh, don't worry, be happy. That what he's saying is rejoice in the reality of the gospel. Rejoice in the Lord Jesus. And it's very clear because he goes on to talk about, remember these two paradigms, 
two different approaches of the way to approach a relationship with God using his own life as an illustration. You remember that? And so he said, hey, rejoice in the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on to say, watch out for the dogs. So if you remember, we talked, there's two different paradigms. There's a paradigm of religion where we base our relationship with God on our own performance, our own righteousness. And Paul said that's how he used to do it. But since he met Messiah, he realized he was off track. And so now he's embraced this new type of paradigm, a paradigm of relationship, where my relationship with God is not based on my performance or my righteousness. It's based on the performance of the Messiah and his righteousness. And as a result, he's entered into this new relationship with God, and he's ready to give up everything he had and consider it scuba law uh, compared to the value of knowing King. King Jesus. You remember that? And so when he said, rejoice in the Lord Jesus, he's not saying, hey, don't worry, be happy. He's saying, don't rejoice in yourself and your performance. Rejoice in the message of the gospel. Rejoice in the Lord, right? And so now we come to chapter four and he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I will say it, And what's easy for us to miss is if you were sitting in the church of Philippi, you would have heard chapter 3, verse 1, five minutes before. Now, for us, we go, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, This is a safeguard for me. It's no trouble. Like, what was that about? That was baptism week. That was like, you know, three weeks ago. But for if you're sitting in the church at Philippi, you're all excited. We got a letter from the Apostle Paul, and they're reading this. You have just heard, rejoice in the Lord, don't rejoice in yourself. And you say, how do you know it's five minutes? Because this afternoon, I read it out loud (laughs) in the Greek, and it took five minutes on the nose. And so... When Paul says rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, he's not saying smile and be happy, be positive. He's saying as followers of Jesus, as we come to the end of this letter, if you're going to live a life worthy of the gospel, you need to remember gospel realities. You need to live your life in light of this epic story of who God is, who you are, the relationship with God you've entered into through Christ, the power of his spirit, this new passion in your life of of living to know him and being transformed by him and being united as a church, advancing the gospel. So keep your perspective. Never lose that perspective. In good times, in hard times, rejoice in the Lord and the reality of the gospel. You see? Now, he adds something significant this time, though. If you look at chapter 4, in verse, uh, verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Right? That's what he said in 3.1. But he goes on to say, Rejoice in the Lord always, like good times and bad times. Now, here's what's interesting. If you were to do a study of the book of Philippians, what you'd find is that the words rejoice or joy that are basically the same word in the Greek. There's alterations of the same word, kara, karain, same word, same family. What you would find is that joy or rejoicing is referred to 16 times in four letters. It is more per page than any other letter of the Apostle Paul. That's why often when you see Bible studies on Philippians or uh, Bible workbooks on Philippians or series of pastors do, that topic is joy. And so what's interesting, though, as you study this, is that often in Christian circles, we have taught that there's a difference between happiness and joy. We've often been taught that happiness is based on circumstances, that joy is based on something else, our relationship with the Lord. But what you'll see as you study it in Philippians, that's not true. That sometimes Paul's joy because he models this life of joy, 
Sometimes his joy is based on external circumstances, what God is doing in his life. He's so excited about. And sometimes they're based on epic realities of the gospel. And so, as you go through, let me, let me give an example. That Paul will say in chapter one, I have so much joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Later in chapter one, he'll say, I am rejoicing because even though my enemies are sharing Christ from bad motives, at least Jesus is getting shared. In chapter two, he'll say, I, you will be able to rejoice because Epaphrodites, your messenger, he was so sick. I thought he was gonna die and I was so bummed out and then God healed him and so we can rejoice over that. External circumstances. When he gets to chapter four, he'll say, man, I'm so, I rejoice so much when I got your big financial gift. Not only for the gift, but for what it means about God's doing your life. So sometimes Paul will rejoice in externals, what he sees God doing in his life, like we do, right? We do the same thing. And then other times, he will rejoice in the epic realities of the gospel in spite of what's happening in his life. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a difference there. So sometimes, so he says, when he says rejoice in the Lord always, that's what he's talking about. That as followers of Jesus, we've entered in this relationship with God where you have been forgiven, the Holy Spirit's come in your life, God is working to transform you, he's got a plan and a purpose, there is a mission for your life, he is with you, he will never leave you, there's nothing you will go through, he did not see coming first, that he will empower you to go through it, and that we have this incredible future that's coming, that's the story we're a part of, and so we're gonna rejoice in the seen when it's a blessing, and we're gonna rejoice in the unseen when it isn't, but as followers of Jesus, we are going to learn how to rejoice even in times of sorrow. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, rejoice is as sorrowful but always rejoicing because we see the big picture. And so Paul says if we're going to live out this gospel, we have to keep our gospel glasses on, keep our perspective. Amen? Okay, number one, that's first step. Now you love that these are kind of all going to fit together. Number two, the second step is we're going to pursue peace. So one of the big topics, if you've been with us uh, throughout this series, if you haven't, you can go back and catch up on YouTube. But uh, if throughout this series, um, the, one of the big topics is unity. If you were here at the beginning of the series, you saw at the end of chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said, hey, whatever happens to me, remember I'm in prison uh, whether I am released, retained, or exit, whatever happens to me, make sure you live your lives in a way that are worthy of the gospel. You stand united as one voice, remember, courage under fire, to advance the gospel. And then in chapter 2, he begins to unpack this for us that apparently there was some sort of significant conflict going on in the church. Maybe these two women, that chapter 4, we talked about that, were kind of at the center of that, that controversy. But there was some sort of uh, uh, conflict going on that was threatening the heart of the church. And so he said, you know, if we're going to live a life worthy of the gospel, then we have to build this community of the king. Because it says the world looks on and sees this incredible community of love that advances the gospel. And so you may remember there in your note sheet, uh, as Paul launched into that section, he said in chapter 2, he said that in order to build this community, he said you need to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in what? Humility. You might remember that's key word, circle it. In humility, value others above yourselves. Not only looking, not looking out only for your own interests, but each of you for the interests of the others and in your relationships with others have the mindset of King Jesus, Christ Jesus, King Jesus, right? And so we talked about this. We talked about this, that, that if we are going to build a community of the king, if we're going to live lives worthy of the gospel, if we're going to build the, the, this, uh, if we're going to advance the gospel, that we're going to have to, remember this, we're going to, em, we're going to reject narcissism, do you remember that? And embrace humility and live a life for others, and follow the example of King Jesus, who's the ultimate example of humility, who, as Paul said, though he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage, but he emptied, he emptied himself, he became a slave, 
and then he even died the worst, uh, most horrifying and painful and humiliating death that Rome could come up with in order to serve us. And so as followers of Jesus, if we're going to build the community, we're going to need to pursue peace, make it a top priority, and embrace these uh, character qualities of King Jesus. And it would seem here at the end of the letter, for reasons that it will become more evident, it will seem very likely that this is what Paul is referring to in chapter 4 and verse 6. So let's look at it together. In chapter 4 and verse 6, so he just said, rejoice in the Lord. Pick it up verse 5, rather. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, which could mean the Lord is always near us, like the Lord's near to the brokenhearted. Or he's always with us, you know, I'll be with you always in the world. Or it could mean he's near in the sense of a second coming. Or it could mean both. I'm not really sure. But he says, hey, uh, the second thing you need to do is let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, here's the, here's the thing. This word for gentleness is a hard word to translate from the Greek. And it's a hard word to define. And the reason is, in the New Testament, it's not used very often. And when it is used, it's almost always used as one of those character qualities in a long list of character, positive character qualities, like, say, for qualifications for an elder. So there's no context around it to understand, like, what does that word mean? But if you look at the most authoritative uh, uh, a dictionary of ancient Greek, um, this, this time period, uh, it, this is how the word would be defined. Let me give you some words. Uh, yielding. Uh, in other words, you don't have to have your own way. You're yielding to others. Um, kind, um, courteous, tolerant. Uh, then our word gentle, the way they, and then not insisting on your own rights. Now this fits in exactly to chapter two, doesn't it? Exactly what Paul said that we're we're not to seek our own, our own ambition. We're to serve one another, and so on. And so. Um, and so it would seem that in this reference here in chapter 4 about let your gentleness be evident, he seems to be picking up on a theme back from chapter 2 of pursuing the unity, embracing humility. And it's interesting because there is one passage in the New Testament where Paul uses the same word gentle uh, that helps us understand and define it. And that's there in your note sheet in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, in chapter uh, 10, where Paul describes the character of King Jesus as a, as a model to follow. And he says, by the humility, notice that word again, by the humility and gentleness, there's our word. And so Paul associates humility and gentleness. So we're kind of getting a feel for how he uses this word, I appeal to you. Now, of course, when you study the life of Jesus, what you see is Jesus is a very strong person, isn't he? He is strong, he is brave, he's fearless, he's courageous. But you also see this beautiful quality of gentleness and the way he deals with others. And you see this beautiful quality of humility that Paul has highlighted in chapter 2 of being willing to do whatever it takes to serve others as being the ultimate mark of humility. And so it seemed like that here at the end of the letter that Paul is calling us back to what he's been talking about earlier in the letter as followers of Jesus, if you want to live a life worthy of the gospel, that you need to grow in your gentleness. Now, I want to point out something he says in 4 or 5. He says, let your gentleness be evident to whom? Let's say it again. It makes you a little nervous, I know. <laughs> but let your gentleness be evident to whom? All. To all. Hmm. What Paul is saying, as followers of Jesus, if we're going to live life worthy of the gospel, that we need to have a reputation for humility and gentleness. Now again, Remember, in the context, that he's very strong, he's brave. It doesn't mean like we're weaklings or like that, right? Jesus is strong, brave, courageous, strong sense of his, his self, his calling. 
But he says that as followers of Jesus, if we're going to advance the gospel, live life worthy of the gospel, that we need to build a reputation in our life for gentleness, humility, easy to get along with. What would be the opposite? Well, like harsh, pig-headed, have to have your own way, um, center of attention. Um, these would be the opposite, right? And so he says, if we're going to live a life, we're going to be... Um, and so the question I'd have for you then as you do some self-evaluation is would those who know you best, so if you're married, spouse, if you're dating, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, uh, closest friends, co-workers, ministry partners on your ministry teams, your life group, would those who know you best say, that person's gentleness, humility, is evident to everyone. If you really want to know, just review your Facebook posts. Is your gentleness evident to all? Okay, so we're going to dance the gospel, live lives worthy. We're going to keep perspective and live in the light of the epic gospel realities. Rejoicing in King Jesus, what he's doing now, what he's doing, I can see and unseen always. And then we're going to pursue peace. We're going to be a person that pursues gentleness and because the Lord is near. We're living as if the Lord is near. Number three, the third step is we need to pray about everything. Now, this comes from Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And so he says, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in every situation, catch that, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And if you do that, the peace of God, which transcends understanding, or it's beyond human understanding, logic, it will guard, remember military word like a garrison, I love it, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, what's interesting to me about this passage is this is one of those plaque verses that you used to buy in Christian bookstores when there were Christian bookstores. <laughs> when there were bookstores. Um, <laughs> that it sounds really awesome until you've got a problem. <laughs> right? Look at that awesome. And then all of a sudden you find out, oh, I have cancer, my son's this, my daughter's this, I lost a job here, and it's like, yes. What's so interesting about this is remember we have to read these final instructions in light of the whole letter. Paul doesn't just pull out a list of, hey, what can I say to wrap this thing up? He's like, a, like a, a pastor would do in a message that at the end you're, you're reminding people of the most important things in light of what you said. And we need to remember who these people were. And if you remember, these are followers of King Jesus, Lord Jesus. These are followers of Jesus whose, whose credo is Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not in the midst of a Roman city. at a time where persecution of Christ followers is on the rise. And if you remember back in chapter one, Paul said, hey, I know you're, you're, I've heard you're going through some significant struggles right now, like I had when I was with you in Philippi, like when I was arrested and beaten and thrown in jail. And you now hear I have in Rome, in prison, that you're going through the same struggles. These are people facing persecution, and my hunch is, as you read the letter, it's more than social rejection than what we sometimes experience, that it probably is big enough, so the way he described it, it's like I'm in, in prison, that the, the, the persecution is likely having economic impact on their income and having perhaps physical impact on even perhaps jail or physical danger. So when Paul says, don't worry about anything, he's writing to persecuted believers. 
who are, may have a hard time putting food on the table, who may have relatives or friends who are in prison, who are being rejected from all the trade guilds. They can't get a job. They're going through hard times. And yet Paul says, hey, don't worry. And what I love about this is that in this passage, and you may have never looked at it like this before. I'm not sure I did until I did this study. But Paul, what Paul's telling us is God has a vision for your life. He has a vision for my life. And as sons and daughters of the king, he doesn't want you and I to have to deal with worry. God's vision for you and I is even in the toughest times, we would have peace. And not just peace, but the peace of God. God's peace. And have you ever thought of this? God doesn't worry. Have you ever thought of that? Like, that's so foreign to us. Like, worry is so much a part of our life. We live in worry, right? You, me, all the we. Like, every day we worry, it's hard for us to imagine someone who has never worried in billions of years. And the reason he doesn't worry is because he's in control. And what Paul is saying is when you come to Jesus, you don't need to worry because your father is in control. So like Jesus said, why do you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink? Don't you know your father? You've got a father now. The pagans don't know this. It makes sense that pagans worry because they don't live in reality. But you have a father who knows what you need before you ask. You don't need to worry. And Paul says that is God's vision for your life. But what I love about this is he's extremely practical. It's one thing to say, don't worry, but yeah, but how do I do that? And Paul says, okay, let's do this. He said, what you need to do is you need to start praying about whatever worries you. And he says, um, big, small, in between, you need to pray about everything. And I think, and I would, I would add here, I think what that means is that whatever worries about us, we need to pray thoroughly and in a radically honest way, that when we worry, we need to figure out what we're worried about. Because often our fear is up here. The cause of the fear, fear is down here. And we have to, what we pray about is this thing up here, we have to figure out, no, what's our real worry? Like, what is scaring me? What am I afraid? Yeah, and we have to keep on asking the why question until we get to the root fear. And then we need to take that root fear in all honesty, radical honesty before the Lord. And Paul says that if we will do that, we will experience the peace of God that is supernatural, that transcends understanding. In other words, it's not the peace that comes from being able to visualize the outcome. There is a peace that we can have based on visualizing a desired outcome, isn't there? Have you ever noticed when you start worrying about something, the moment you think like, oh, I think I see how this could work out, you start feeling better. And that's fine, but what Paul is saying, he's talking about a peace that transcends understanding. It's beyond logic. It's beyond the ability to see how things will work out. It is a peace that is the peace of God, the peace that God has, because he knows it's all under control. I remember one time in my life of experiencing this in a dramatic way. I won't go into the great detail, but when I was 18, I found out one day that there was a warrant out for my arrest. And uh, it was for extortion. And uh, there were some racial overtones to this case of what I was being accused of and that the sheriff in our city was really ticked off about the accusations that had been made. There was a warrant out for my arrest, and they were coming out, they were coming after me. And I had just watched the week before a movie about what happens to young men when they go into prison. <laughs> and I was, I have never, 
been so scared in all my life. And I remember, and of course you're 18, you have all perspective, right? I remember curling up by the side of the house about six o'clock in the morning when I got the news. My friend had woken up. Hey, there's a, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this, but there's a warrant out for arrest. The sheriff's are coming. There's extortion. You know, you're being, we're being accused of extortion. And I remember going up beside the side of the house and just being devastated, never so scared. Because the story that had been told to the police had a lot of truth in it. It wasn't true, but it was very believable. And uh, I don't even know if you've ever been in a situation where you feel very vulnerable and you're not sure the truth is going to help you. And I remember kind of curling up there by the side of the house under the avocado trees about six in the morning, scared to death. And then after that, climbing in the back of my friend's Datsun pickup <laughs> with a shell on and just being so scared and calling out to God. And in the midst of that, God just meeting me. And I felt this peace begin to wash over my body and every piece of tension went out, and I literally fell asleep. And obviously, I wasn't arrested. I'm here today. <laughs> but this is the peace of God. It's a peace, not that every situation is that dramatic. I don't mean that, but this was the most I experienced, the peace of God. Had anything changed? Were the sheriff not coming? Were they not going to find me? Uh, where the, it, it, nothing had changed, nothing had changed, and yet I went from being scared to death to completely at peace and going to sleep. It's a peace beyond logic. I want to point out a couple things here. You're, you're, one thing you might ask is, well, how often should I pray like this? I'd say as often as it takes. You know, in my life, probably in your life, what I find is that when something's really worrying me, I pray it through. I spend time. Maybe you journal it. I often journal it. It's helpful to put it into words. You, you, you spend some time. You spell it all out. And I, and I experience the peace of God coming. And then it could be a day later, a week later, or an hour later, I feel it again. And I've got to go back and do it again. And the other thing I'd say is I want you to notice what Paul says, that as followers of Jesus, we're to pray about, at all times, about everything. And what that means is followers of Jesus, there is nothing too big and nothing too small to pray about. There's times where I see where our country is going, and it just hits me hard, and I feel that worry. I've got to pray about something big. I've got to pray about our nation. There's other times there'd be things I'm praying about that just be embarrassed to even say. They're just small, you know? I'll let Dre tell you. Um, <laughs> it's not as small as his things like oatmeal raisins, but they're still <laughs> small. That sends him into a tizzy, but... Um, <laughs> but here's the rule. Here's the rule. The rule is, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Can I tell you something? Sometimes people will say, I don't want to bother God with that, with my little issues. And when we say that, what we're revealing, whether we realize it or not, is that we have a very low view of God. Because what our mind is saying is, like, I know he's got a lot on his plate, and I don't want him to blow a fuse by my little issues. And I'm afraid if I bring up my issues, you know, this whole crisis in, Ru in Russia may go crazy because he's like <laughs> looking at my stuff, you know? <laughs> so we see God as like a bigger version of ourselves. He has limited RAM. He's got limited bandwidth, right? I don't want to put a burden on him. Seriously, he might blow a fuse. Isaiah 40 says that God's strength is not limited. 
And Isaiah 40 says that his understanding no one can fathom. The God that we serve is a God without limits. And so there is nothing too big and nothing too small. If you're worried about it, you need to pray about it. And let me tell you this. This is one of the reasons why spending time with God on a regular basis, one-on-one, what we call here developing a rhythm of relationship, one-on-one, it's one of the reasons it is so important. Because if you don't have a time in your life, you regularly meet with God, it's part of your life, where you can process your life, you will miss out on the peace of God in your life. Because you have not followed the instruction manual that when you're worried, you need to pray about everything if you want the peace of God to guard your hearts and mind. It's one of the reasons why spending time with him is so important. Now, number four. The fourth step, Paul says, so we're going to, we're going to keep our perspective and we're going to pursue peace and we're going to pray about everything. The fourth step, we're going to live the gospel, is we need to remove, renew our minds. In other words, we need to look at life from a whole new perspective and we need to start kind of thinking gospel, like thinking through life into making gospel choices in our life. And this comes from 4 8, where he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and excellent, praiseworthy, think about, reflect on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, you have to reprogram your mind. Are you with me? If you want to live a life that's worthy of the gospel, you want to be transformed to be the person you're created to be, you have to reprogram your mind. You have to learn to change the way you think. You say, about what? About everything. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Famous verse, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't don't approach life like the way the culture around you does it. He says, but be what? Be transformed, right? That's the core, to be changed, to be like Jesus, what it's all about. But he says, this is the way it happens. Be transformed by the what? Right? You have to change the way you think. And he says, and if you do, then, notice circle the then, if you do, then, You'll be able to test and approve, I like the word experience, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, God has a plan for your life. It's a plan for transformation, for renewal, for recreation. He says, but in order to experience that plan, it doesn't happen automatically. You have to change the way you think. And he says that if you do, you'll be transformed, and then God has a will, it's, 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 uh, it's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect, but you can only experience that if your mind is transformed. Have you ever wondered why you see two Christians of similar backgrounds, they both come to Jesus and 30 years later, their lives are completely different. One has been radically transformed in beautiful ways And one is barely different than it was before they came to Jesus. What happened? One person renewed their mind and one person didn't. And as a result, one was transformed and experienced the will of God that was good, that was pleasing, that was perfect, and one didn't. God had a similar vision for both people. One experienced it, one didn't. And so Paul says, as we come to the end of the letter, you have to learn to think about life a new way. Well, what do you mean, Paul? So, well, let me, let me give you some words that you can run, like it's a grid to run through your decisions, to run through your perspectives, the way you think, uh, the choices you make, the values, your priorities, the way you think about, re- the way you approach relationships, 
the way you approach parenting, the way you approach marriage, the way you approach dating, the way you approach sexuality, the way you approach your finances, the way you approach your career. He says, let me give you some, a grid to run through. Here are some questions when you're making decisions about what to believe or how to approach or priorities or how to handle a situation. Here are some questions. Ask the question, is this true? Is it true? It, is this what I'm being told by my is culture? Is this true or false? Is it right or is it wrong? Is it noble or ignoble? Is it pure or impure? Is it admirable or is it shameful? Is it praiseworthy or is it worthy of uh, the opposite of praise? Whatever that means. <laughs> is it, you know, that... As followers of Jesus, he says, I can't give you a rule for everything. <laughs> These letters cost about two grand to write. <laughs> money's tight. I have less than four chapters. I don't have as much money as I had when I wrote Romans. <laughs> so let me give you some general guidelines. Just get in the habit of thinking through a grit and asking yourself, Hey, this way I'm handling this boss at work, is that noble? Am I taking the high road in this relationship? If others knew what I was watching in my entertainment, would that be praiseworthy or would I be ashamed? Um, the way I'm handling this situation with my children, is that really right? That if we, he says, just get in the habit of asking these questions. And as you ask the question and answer the question honestly and act on the answer, you will be transformed by a renewing of your mind and you will begin to experience the will of God for your life, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And last of all, number five. The last, the last step is to follow your models. And of course, I love what Paul, this flows out of 4.9. <clears throat> Whatever you have learned or received or heard in me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, this is not the first time that Paul has talked about models. It's a big theme in Philippians. Do you remember back in chapter 3 where Paul was using his life as an illustration of the two paradigms, religion and relationship, and then he said, so now as a follower of Jesus, this is my new approach to life. I, we talked about this a couple weeks ago when I was teaching on the, the passionate pursuit. You remember that? He said that my goal in life now is to know Jesus, uh, to experience the power of his resurrection in my life, being conformed to his suffering that might be, become part, experience the power of the resurrection. And so he says, I, I run hard towards this like an athlete. Remember that? And then he said, Hey, as many of us are as mature should approach life this way. And we talked about this. And we talked about this in Christian circles. We often look at like, like Paul is up here and I am down here. So I'll take his teaching, I'll divide it by 10, dilute it by 10, and I'll be a, about the appropriate dosage for me. And what we saw that, that weekend was that no, 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 that as followers of Jesus, we have different life callings. We're not called to have different passions, different pursuits, different priorities. But as followers of Jesus, Paul is modeling for us what it looks like to follow Jesus. And he has said it over and over, and now he says it again. And it's not just about him. It's not about follow me because I'm perfect. He told us in chapter 3, I'm not. In fact, in 3.17, last week when Dre was teaching, we looked at this verse where it says in 3.17, he says, join together in following my example. So there he is, you know, follow me as I follow Jesus. Remember Dre talked on that. He said, brothers, it says, and just as you have us as a what? A model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. It's not about following Paul. He's just the person he knows the best, that they know the best, so he can be a model. But he says, hey, follow me, 
follow people that live their life like me. We're all kind of following the same way. And so you almost get the sense, as Paul is writing this letter, that he's like, okay, so, hey, I don't have time to give you all the, all the commandments, uh, how, all the instructions, but so use this grid. Use this grid. Hey, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is, here's some general guidelines, but you almost get a sense of like, that's not good enough. Like, that's helpful, right? Those real, the super helpful question. But do you ever feel like, I, yeah, I know, but I'm not sure what to do. In I just need like a model. I need just flesh and blood. I need someone, like, I need to visualize this. Like, I understand I'm supposed to be a noble father. I understand I'm supposed to be a praiseworthy husband. But, but I, what does that look like in flesh and blood? Like, I, I, I'm committed to doing that. I just don't know what it looks like. And you almost get the sense that Paul says he gives all these beautiful qualities to the guy. He says, hey, and on top of that, if you're, if you're not sure, just kind of follow me. Just kind of do it like I do. He's like, like, you know me. You've heard my teaching. You've been there when I've taught, but you've also just seen my life. We've hung out. We've had dinner. I've, you know me personally. Just kind of, if you're not sure, just do what you think I would do. And if you do, it'll work out. The God of peace will be worth, with, with you. And I just think for all of us that it's so important that we have models in our life to follow. And so for us as followers of Jesus, of course, Jesus is our model, Right? And of course, Paul is our model. And so what I want you to catch is we need to get rid of this idea that Paul is so far ahead of me, I can't be like him. He's an apostle. Like if you believe the Bible is the word of God, you've got problems with that because three times in this book, he's already told us to follow his example. Like God has told you three times in this series to follow Paul's example. He's not up here. He's just our older brother in Jesus we're the younger brothers and sisters, and we're to grow up and be like him. And so that's awesome. We've got Paul, we've got Jesus, we've got John, we've got, we've got these great biblical things. But you know what? They're still not flesh and blood to us. For the Philippians, Paul was flesh and blood. They knew Paul in a way we don't. We know his writings, we know his mind but we don't know what it was like to hang out with him for an evening. We don't know how he handled tough situations. They did. And in our lives, we need men and women who are in different areas of their life are models for us. And we need to select those models well. And then we need to pay close attention to their lives. You know, we started the day with this story of this man who gets up at 5.30 in the morning and uh, he's, it's a cold winter morning and, and he gets, you know, shower shaves, gets dressed and goes out to this cold garage to spend this time with, with God. And that's the story of my father. And so um, when I grew up, um, I watched my dad do that. He, he was not a man of words. And so he never even really talked about why he did it. And when he put the verses up, which didn't happen very often, every few months maybe, he would never even explain why that verse. Sometimes he'd make us memorize it. <laughs> Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Christ Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, I learned that from my dad, you know. The man who has a... Uh, the, the man who fears the Lord, his children have a safe refuge over the phone, right, from Proverbs. But he would never really talk about it. About it. But early on, I picked up that if I, if I wanted to have a relationship with God, I needed to pursue him. It wasn't enough to go to church. It wasn't enough to be involved. I needed to pursue him one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I, did, I still had to figure out how to do that. That was a lot of trial and error, a lot of failure over the years. But here's the thing, when pastors, when spiritual leaders would say you need to spend time one-on-one -on -one with God, that didn't seem weird to me. It didn't seem unachievable to me. I lived with a man who did that every day of my life. Some of you have never had a model. 
And so when you hear that, spending time with God, you, that sounds extreme, that sounds radical, that sounds undoable. It never sounded like that to me because I had a model. And little did he know the impact he was having on his own family, his having on the son, or the calling on the son's life to one day teach thousands of people. That's the way models work. Models impact us. And so sometimes God uses models of, my dad was my first model. He wasn't perfect anyway, but there's many things he modeled. Well, my dad modeled integrity to me. He was a man of integrity to the bone. I cannot even imagine my dad lying under any circumstances. I cannot imagine that. And so for me, integrity is just like, well, Yes, it's a way of life. Uh, my dad modeled a love for God's word. When he w- we would drive home from church, he would say, I know the pastor said this. I'm not really sure I agree because of this passage. He was modeling that the word is the authority, not the pastor. And then sometimes pastors get it wrong. And if you want to know God, you need to study the word for yourself. My dad was a generous giver. I never had to struggle with, should I tithe? That was not a big concept. That was not a big struggle for me. I had to struggle whether God was calling me to tithe. But the concept, it was easy. I'd grown up with that my whole life. Models are powerful, and God will bring models in your life. And there'll be sometimes a different model for different areas. It won't just be one person but this person's a model of how to be a father or a a husband or a wife. And this person's a model of how to do their finances. And this person's a model of how to serve. And this person's a model of how to love. And we need to be aware of that who are walking by this standard, as Paul says. And when we find those mentors, we need to not just say, that's really cool, I respect them. We need to lock on and start asking ourselves, what would Joe do in his marriage if he were in this situation? In a couple weeks, I'm going to introduce you to a Stoic philosopher named Seneca. And the reasons will be apparent then. But I've been reading his book. He was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, writing in Rome when Paul was in prison. And he was, uh, he was one of the famous, most famous, influential men of his time. And in this letter, he says, we need to set our affections on some good man, like the Apostle Paul or someone that lives it out. And we need to keep him constantly before our eyes so that we may live as if he were watching us and do everything as if he saw what we were doing. Choose someone whose way of life as well as words and whose very face as mirroring the character that lies behind it, have won your approval. Be always pointing him out to yourself, either as your guardian or as your model. There is need, in my view, for someone as a standard against which our character can measure themselves. Without a ruler to do it against, you won't make the crooked straight. Let's pray. Father, as we come towards the end of this letter, it's just amazing advice, these little epigrams, short statements, pithy final markers, but they are powerful statements reminding us of what we learn in Philippians, that we need to live in the light of the gospel. We need to pursue peace. We need to pray about everything. We need to renew our minds and see things from your perspective. And we need to follow our models. We pray today as we continue now in worship, as we bring you our tithes, our gifts, our offerings, you would use these place, these gifts to build a place where it would advance the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me?